Good morning. We're going to sing a duet together to start off. The <laughs> You'd run so fast if we did. <clears throat> well, we've been in this series called Walking, and um, it comes out of 1 John, and we've been doing this for about four weeks now. And it's basically John is writing to us, and he's telling us to walk in Christ, to, to follow Christ in our life. And so today, the topic is walking together. And since it's walking together, I thought, well, it might be kind of fun to preach together. So we're going to share this sermon this morning, and uh, we're going to speak together, preach together as we walk together. And in the Christian life, the one thing I want to point out real quick here, in the Christian life, there's someone who wants to get you off the path. There's someone who doesn't want you to walk on the narrow path. And his name is Satan. And he's not fictional. He's real. He's alive. And the Bible speaks about him countless times. In 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter says this, Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So Satan has a very clear agenda. And what he wants to do is he wants to kill, steal, and destroy your relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants to kill, steal you. He wants you to take the broad road that leads to destruction and spend an eternity in hell. He wants you to get off the narrow path that leads to eternal life. And so every day we are going against this enemy trying to get us off the path. Now I don't know if you've ever been hiking. Uh, maybe down at Mohican State Park or maybe you've gone to... Um, the Smokies, Gatlinburg area, North Carolina, or maybe you've been to the Appalachian Trail. And if you ever go hiking, you, you pull up to the trailhead, and a lot of times at the trailhead there's a sign, right? It welcomes you to the trail, it gives you some information about the trail, has some rules, do not litter, you know, do not pull the plants, that type of thing. But there's also warnings on those trail signs. And, and those things are there so that you can have an enjoyable hike, that you can have an enjoyable day in, in the wilderness, and it's there for your benefit. I like the one, one of my favorites was an advisory that was put out by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and it was advising hikers, hunters, and campers to be alert for bears while they were out hiking. This is what it supposedly read. We advise the hikers wear noisy little bells on their clothing so as not to stumble onto a bear and startle him. And also carry pepper spray in case of an encounter with a bear. Makes a lot of sense. Goes on to say, it's also a good idea to watch out for fresh signs of bear activity. Trail walkers should recognize the difference between black bear and grizzly bear droppings. Black bear droppings are smaller and contain lots of berries and squirrel fur. Okay? Grizzly bear droppings have little bells in it and smell like pepper. <laughs> so... <clears throat> I really doubt that's true sign. But it is a good reminder, true or not, it is a good reminder for us that there are rules, there are expectations, there are warnings that we should watch out for as we go through this Christian life. And this world has rules, and the rules of this world are to get you on the broad path that lead to destruction. The world does not want you on the narrow path that leads to eternal life. So we need to come alongside each other. We need to walk together in this Christian life, and we need to follow the guide. And we're going to talk about those things in here in a while. But while you're on the narrow path, as Craig's going to speak about in a while, it can be rocky, it can be difficult. And there are times when you're following the guide, and it feels like he's walking you right along the edge of a cliff. There are times when it feels like, man, he's going to walk me right over the cliff. And there are times where you sense that you are just in a valley. But the bottom line is that we need to follow the guide. So if you would, take your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 John. 1 John. And we're going to look at a lot of different verses. So if you want to put a piece of paper in 1 John, if you want to put your finger in 1 John and kind of hold that open, we're going to jump around in 1 John. But for right now, go to 1 John chapter 1. Chapter 1. And we're going to learn how we can walk this Christian life together. So we're together on the trail. We come to the trailhead and we're beginning this journey of the Christian life together and there are some warnings on the sign on what it is to walk the Christian life. And so the first warning we're going to see as we walk this Christian life together is this, never walk alone. Never walk alone. The Christian life is not a journey that we make by ourselves. Okay? There's something within us sometimes though we go, eh, you know, 
I mean, I'm good. I'm good by myself. It's just a walk. It's, it's just a hike. You know, I, I, I can, I'm fine by myself. Nothing, nothing bad is going to happen. But just a reoccurring, reoccurring theme of Scripture is never walk alone. Never walk alone. Always walk this path together. And we see here in 1 John that John continually refers to his readers as brothers and sisters. Well, that means that they're family. In fact, in the first few verses of 1 John chapter 1, he says the word, and you can underline it in your Bible if you want, he uses the word fellowship four times. Two times in verse 3, one time in verse 6, and one time in verse 7, he uses this word fellowship. Look at 1 John chapter 1 verse 3. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And then he adds this. We write this to make our joy complete. Now that word fellowship, all right, if you've been in church much, you know that word fellowship is a churchy word. We love to throw that word fellowship around. It's a churchy word. And I think, honestly, that word fellowship has lost a lot of its meaning. It's been watered down throughout the years. It's lost its significance. And so there's a lot of depth of fellowship, but just to kind of model the way we look at fellowship now, uh, Craig and I are going to do a little demonstration of what fellowship looks like within the church right now. So we're just going to demonstrate this is fellowship. Hey, man, did you watch any football yesterday? Uh, yes, I did. I watched the Buckeyes thrash the uh, Cornhuskers. Yeah, Elijah yeah. had a football game. Boy, a lot there. of Buckeye fans out there. Yeah, they're Ooh, really yeah. excited, can't you yeah. tell? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I watched the Vols, and they <laughs> they really stink this year. And they got a rough one coming up, yeah, too. So. Yeah, but, you know, my second team, Penn State, they're going to move up to number two this week. So. Uh, they won't stay there that long when the Buckeyes yeah, beat them in yeah. two weeks. So. How about this weather? Uh, yeah, it's not bad. I figure it'll be a little bit colder this time of the year. It's going to yeah. be cold tomorrow. Yeah, I'm kind of enjoying it. Yeah. 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 yeah, good fellowship with Yeah. Yeah, good to see it. And that's kind of what fellowship looks like in the church, right? I mean, we, we go through this, we, we pass people in the church parking lot, we wave, we talk to them in the foyer, and it's like, hey, how you doing? Did you watch the game? How about those Indians? Yeah, yeah, they stink too. You know, and so it's just, it's just you know, hey, good fellowship with Christians today, right? And that's kind of the way we go about it. But there's a, this word has so much more significance to it than that. And it comes from the Greek word koinonia. Koinonia, and which literally means sharing something significant in common. And, and so it's something significant. In fact, we come together in spite of our differences. In spite of the fact that we are from different backgrounds, we come together because we have this one great thing in common. I was talking to a person not too long ago, and I was talking to him about what it meant to be a member of the church and what it kind of looks like. And and what it means, and he basically, you know, had been attending a while, and he said, you know, I really don't, I don't really want to become a member of a church because I really just see it nothing more than becoming a member of a country club or a social club. But that's not, that's not what the church is. When we talk about becoming a member of the church, we're not talking about a club, we're not talking about a social organization, we're talking about becoming a member of the family a body of Christ, that together in 1 John 1, 3, he says we have fellowship with one another because of the Father, which makes you and me brothers and sisters in Christ, which means we are a family. So we come together because we have this one great thing in common, and that one great thing is God the Father. We have that in common. And one of the things I've discovered, and, and I've seen in people, is oftentimes they scoff at this rule, never walk alone. And over the years, I've had countless people look at me and go, well, you know, Wes, I can worship God driving down the road. I can worship God drinking a cup of coffee and sitting on my back deck on Sunday mornings. And I'm not going to deny that you can do that. You can. And you should. But there's value in coming together as a family to worshiping God. Because inevitably, what's going to happen is you're going to be walking down that road, and you're going to trip, you're going to fall, you're going to twist an ankle, and what you're going to find yourself is you're going to find yourself very lonely with no one there to help you along this path. So we need to travel it together. And what we hear with increasing frequency in our society today is this. I'm going to say yes to Jesus, but I'm going to say no to the church. And that's a shame. 
As a matter of fact, the statistics right now are alarming in our country, and not only in our country, honestly, in this church right here in Millersburg, that the average attender now attends church one or two Sundays a month. You know, it, it used to be that the family would get together and they would plan other things around Sunday morning worship. Now the family gets together and they plan everything else and go, oh, looks like we can squeeze church in this Sunday. And what example are we setting? What are we saying to our, our young children when we plan everything else around and we say, well, we, we don't really need to go to church this week because we're going to go do this. We need each other. We need to be coming together. And when you think about it, you need to know this, and this is true, all right? Community, this is where we, 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 we experience it. And a lot of people, you know, they stray away from church because they had a bad church experience or, you know, something went wrong or they see the warts of the church and so they just, they just want to stay away from the church, but they're missing out. And I know several people who watch the sermons on YouTube, you know, but I, I would love to see them dive in dive into this community, and I'm glad they watch them. I really am. That's why they're there, and I'm glad people watch it. But there's something about community and coming together and worshiping together and being on this journey together. And when you think about it, the church will always be imperfect. We're always going to be imperfect. But our head of the church, Jesus Christ, he is perfect, and he always will be. And so we come together, and when we come together, we're surrounded by other Christians, we realize that we are on this journey with other people who are like-minded, and we have this in common. Now, it's interesting, in verse 3, John points out, he says, we write this so that you'll have fellowship with us. And then in verse 4, he adds that we write this to make our joy complete. So it's this idea that if we follow Jesus, we'll have joy. There's joy in following Jesus. But he adds, he says, our joy is complete when we follow Jesus together when we do it together. That's what we're made for. One of the preachers I studied when I was in college was a man by the name of Fred Craddock. And Fred Craddock um, tells of his father, who wasn't a Christian. As a matter of fact, he was very skeptical of the whole church thing. And Fred had tried to get his dad to come to church for years. He wouldn't go to church. Other preachers tried to get Fred's dad to go to church, and he just always had the same excuse, always had the same reason. He said, well, you know, all you want is another name on the membership roll and another dollar in the bucket. All right. And so they had no luck with this guy. But then he became very ill. And he had to have a serious surgery where he had part of his throat removed. And he could no longer talk, and he had withered away to about 74 pounds. And that's when he began to discover the love of the church. The people of the church began to show up at his house bringing meals and cards and flowers. They were coming to visit this man who had never attended the church. They were praying with him. And the last conversation Fred had with his dad, he had taken a stack of cards from the people of the church, and he took them to his dad, and his dad sat there and he read through the cards, and then he took a piece of paper and a pen, and he wrote down the words of Shakespeare's Hamlet, and he wrote this. He said, in this harsh world, draw your breath in pain to tell my story. And he handed that to his son. And Fred read it, and then he said, well, well Dad, what's your story? And he took the pen and the paper back, and he wrote, I was wrong. I was wrong. Listen, don't get down the path to a point where you have to say, I was wrong. We walk this journey together. Come to realize you need help now, and we walk together. We were never meant to travel this road alone. When God created this earth, he created Adam. And what did he say? It is not good for man to be alone. And so he created a helper suitable for Adam. We were made for koinonia, for fellowship, for the needing for one another. We dare not walk this path by ourselves. <clears throat> Warning number two uh, that we need to take heed of is when walking together, we all need to agree to use the map. Uh, how many of you like to travel? Lots of people in here. Oh, yeah. When planning a trip, it's, it's important to, to pack a bag of the, the necessary clothes that you'll need, uh, maybe some snacks for the car, and if you have kids, maybe some stuff that will keep them occupied so they're not asking, are we there yet, every five minutes. <clears throat> but the most important thing that you'll need are the directions on how to get to where you're going. Without those ever-important directions, you will probably get lost. Every couple of years or so, our family likes to 
<clears throat> head to the East Coast to, to North Myrtle Beach in, in South Carolina. And one of the first things that Jen does when we decide that we're going and we have our date is that she orders uh, what they call a triptych from AAA. Now, a, a triptych uh, is this little notebook that they give you that basically maps out your entire route to your destination. It has all the exits that you'll need to take, uh, how many miles you're on each stretch of the highway, and it even lets you know if there are detours uh, because of construction and what alternate routes to take. It's a, a very vital and important thing to have when we go on our long trips. <clears throat> Without it, I, I would run the risk of taking a wrong exit and possibly getting us lost. In fact, I know I would because I, I think I know all these shortcuts and I, I do get us lost. Uh, but even as a kid, I remember my, my, my dad would, you know, get out his big Rand McNally road map. You guys remember those things? Oh, yeah, th they were huge. And he would map out a course, and we'd go to Indiana or, or, or to Iowa to, to see family. And sadly, those big road maps, which as a kid, I thought those were so cool because on those trips, I'd sit in the back seat, and I'd have this big road map uh, laid out on my, on my lap, and I would follow the roads that we were taking and what towns were coming upon, and, oh, here's the state line coming up. That was a cool thing to do. But sadly, those, those big road maps are, are kind of a thing of the past now because everyone literally has a road map on their phone in the form of a GPS. Now, let's think about what happens when we try to navigate life without any directions. What happens? The same thing. We get lost. It becomes a mess, and we can take a wrong turn or take what we think is a shortcut, and before we know it, we're lost. Fortunately, God has given us a road map or a GPS, if you will, to help, us guide, uh, to help guide us through this journey that we call life. And that road map is his word, the Bible. In Psalm chapter 119, verse 105, David writes this. He says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. The Bible offers us some of the most vital information, not just for short trips, but for the long road ahead as well. Without the word of God, we would be hopelessly lost, constantly wandering and trying to find our own way. And here's the thing. As we travel through life together, our direction shouldn't be decided by one person's feelings or opinion. We shouldn't follow a, a well-traveled road assuming that it's the right way simply because so many others have traveled it. We have a map, and that map is the Bible. And the Bible needs to be our authority in leading us through life. Uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, uh, we started a, a, a new series in youth group based upon uh, the book of James. Great book. Lots of meat in it. <laughs> Lots of heavy stuff in it. And um, I was asking some questions and stuff, and the kids were saying, oh, pray, read your Bible, so forth. Uh, typical answers that most of us would give. Okay? And, and Jeremy piped up. He said, you know what? He goes, those are good answers. When we're lost or we need to seek directions... We do need to pray. We do, we, we do need to open our Bible and read it. He goes, but here's the thing. If you don't open your Bible and read it, it doesn't mean anything. Open it. Seek those directions. Reading it. And the Bible is so important because it leads us to Jesus. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, it says, We know that we come to know him if we keep his commands. If we are obedient and following God's roadmap, then our journey leads us to Jesus and to eternal life. And if you jump ahead to chapter 3, verse 24, it reads, The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gives us. Most of you in here believe in Jesus, and you read your Bible, and you try to follow it to the best of your ability every day. And that's because you know the one who wrote this book. And you're allowing him to guide you through life. And unfortunately, there may be some in here who have gotten away from God and have, have maybe gotten away from church on a regular basis. And maybe you rarely look at your Bible anymore. And all of a sudden, you realize you found yourself lost. 
you're lost and you're trying to get back on track. But here's some good news for you. The same God who loves you this morning will love you even when you're lost. And he's willing to show you his love through the Bible. And so when you're in darkness, this will be your light. And when you don't know where you're going or or you don't know what to do or what to say, this will be your map. This book is our road map to heaven. Live by these words and you'll never stray from that path. Ignore these words and you'll wander far away from God's plan for your life. And the author of this book will travel with you. Look to him. Listen to him. The one who wrote this book is the one who loves you the most. Warning number three is we're walking on this path is always walk during the day. Walk during the day. There's a lot of value to that. I mean, I got a wife, I have daughters, and when my daughters were in high school and they had these jobs at the mall or in restaurants, I'd always tell them if they were working the night shift, hey, when you go out to your car, make sure somebody walks with you to your car. Always walk with somebody, like Jeremy was talking about earlier. And then there was Heidi. I mean, when she was running, she loved to go running after dark, and she'd do that a lot of times by herself, and I never liked that. I mean, I never liked that because... Because the reason is, there's more safety in light than there is in darkness. If you look in your Bibles at 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7, through 7, it says this. This is our theme verse for the whole series, too. It says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. So we need that light to maintain fellowship. Now, there's nothing wrong with having friends outside of the church that are non-Christians. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to do that. You know, yesterday I spent some time with my mountain bike club. None of those guys in my club are Christians. That's my, you know, evangelism field right there as I'm trying to form a friendship with these men. And it's okay to have a close friend that's not a Christian. But when you're talking about koinonia, when you're talking about that true fellowship, it happens with those who are fellow believers. Because when you have a close fellow believer and you have that koinonia with that person, there's no masks. You take off the masks, you're real with one another, there's no secrets, there's no hiding anything, there's no lies, it's just being with one another in the truth. There's no deception, you are moving away from sin. Do you remember Christ's observation on the night that he was arrested and betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? You remember there was this mob that came after him. It was a very volatile time. I mean, this huge mob that came to find him, and they find Jesus in the garden. And when they do, Peter, you know, being Peter, he gets all riled up, and he starts to fight on behalf of Jesus, and he cuts off this soldier's ear. Jesus is like, no, 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 stop. And he I guess, puts the ear back on this guy. I mean, I'd love to see that played out. But, you know, he he heals this soldier right there in front of him. And then he looks at this mob that came to arrest him. And he looks at them and he says, Am I leading a rebellion that you come at me with clubs and swords? He says, Every day you saw me in the temple courts teaching. And you never talked to me. You never laid a hand on me. And then he said this. This is your hour. When darkness reigns. Have you ever noticed how we're more prone to toy with temptation at midnight than we are at noon? Why is it that we dabble with the darkness and we find ourselves a little bit freer when it's dark than in a setting when it is light? Why is a a nightclub darker than a Bell Store gas station? It's always a little bit darker. It's because there's this maze of destruction, these decisions that take place when we are walking in the darkness as opposed to walking in the light. We need people in our lives who are willing to say, look, here's the light. You're starting to stray. You're starting to get into the darkness. Here's the light. These people that will hold us accountable, we need each other. There's a phrase, and I think it came out of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it it says this, you're only as sick as your secrets. And your secrets, they thrive and they germinate in the darkness. And so the challenge is to find someone that you can walk together with in the light 
who will help point you in the light. And when you start to get on that fringe and, and you're about to fall off into the darkness, that person can point you back into the direction of the light, back on the narrow path. We need these people to walk together with, and that's why we walk together. As we walk this life together, we're going to hit some very rough parts of the trail. Uh, there are parts of this trail that are smooth, that are flat, uh, uh, easy, very much enjoyable to travel. Uh, and that's when walking through life is fun. Unfortunately, we live in a broken and a fallen world, and because of that, there are parts of the trail that are rocky, that are, that are flooded, that are uphill. Um, and that's the thing about walking through life. Trials will come. In James chapter 1, it talks about how we will all experience trials and, and temptations and how we should go about handling each one. And in John 16, verse 33, Jesus himself says, In this world you will have trouble. Whether it's a, a health crisis or uh, financial problems, a, a heartache from a from broken relationship, rest assured, whatever it is, that, that sometimes the path can get pretty rough. And sometimes it may seem that there's no possible way to travel through. And because of this, we have to be prepared for difficult terrain. Part of being prepared for the obstacles that life throws in our way is walking together. See, there's a reason that God created Eve for Adam. He created her to, to be a helpmate to him. He didn't create Eve to be a servant for Adam, but someone who could walk through life with him and celebrate the joyous occasions of life and, and endure the hardships of life together. That's why Paul mentored Timothy. Paul was able to invest in this young man, Timothy, and he was able to, to show him the ropes of ministry and, and help prepare him for life. And when they went their separate ways, Paul still kept tabs on Timothy, encouraging him as Timothy started his own ministry. The bottom line is this. God does not intend for us to go through life alone. That's why he puts people in our lives so that we can have someone to celebrate the good news with and, and have that critical support when the going gets rough. I want to give you two more ways in how we can find strength in the midst of difficult times. First, instead of trying to avoid suffering, learn from it and grow from it. Learn from it and grow from it. Keep in mind that, that, that God is more interested in making you holy than he is making you comfortable. Because holiness has an eternal value to it. God wants to help you become more like his son Jesus. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We learn to become more like Jesus by confessing our sins and, and enduring the hard times and developing a stronger character in the process. The character of Jesus. So instead of trying to, to avoid suffering, ask God to use it to accomplish His good and His perfect will for your life. Ask God to help you view your hardship from the perspective of how it advances God's will for you. Second, follow your faith and not your feelings. Follow your faith and not your feelings. Choose to believe God's promises that he is always in control of your life. He always loves you and he always cares for you. He will never leave you nor forsake you, no matter how you may feel when you're facing life's obstacles. And since our feelings are, are constantly changing, it would be very unwise for us to make decisions based upon something that is so unreliable and really irrational. When facing trials, we should base our decisions on biblical truth, which is always, always reliable. Trust that the Holy Spirit is with you as you deal with these hard times, even when you don't sense His presence or, or understand what you're going through. Follow Christ's direction so that you can learn to trust in God. And when we're able to do that, when we discover the, the truthfulness of God's promises by our obedience, and we need to be on our guard against these, these forces of evil who want to, to use our feelings to discredit God and His promises, 
Remember, it is so much easier to, to walk through life with others. Others who can keep us accountable along the way. Others who can encourage us, support us, and help us keep our focus on Christ. It's so much easier to walk with someone than it is to walk alone. And that leads us to our last point. When walking through life together, you still have to trust your guide. You still have to trust your guide. Trust your guide and trust the directions that he's giving you. If you stray from those directions and you don't listen to your guide, again, you find yourself getting lost. Uh, if you've been reading uh, along with this in First John during the sermon series, you'll notice that, that John continually points us back to, to Christ as our guide. Uh, the verse that we keep coming back to is 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, which says, Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Jesus has gone on before us. Uh, he has lived a perfect life. Uh, Jesus himself says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so if Jesus has successfully navigated this life and he has shown us the way that we must go, then why wouldn't we want to put our faith and trust in him to guide us? Well, let's look at it this way. A lot of you will remember the story in Matthew chapter 14 of, of when the disciples uh, were sailing across the, the Sea of Galilee and this massive storm comes up and it catches them by surprise. Uh, the wind and the waves, it says, just, just battered them all night. They're afraid. They think they're going to die. And meanwhile, Jesus isn't with them. What's Jesus doing? He's up on a mountaintop. He's up on a mountaintop and he's praying. He's praying to God. Now, he could have finished praying, stood up, looked out there and said, Hey, they're in trouble. And just calm the storm right then and there. But that's not what he did. Jesus walked out on the water and he went to them. He met them where they were. When traveling rough patches in the road of life, we can hang our hat on one truth. God has a divine purpose in the midst of our suffering. Our job is to trust him through it and wait and see the spiritual fruit that develops because of it. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the suffering of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. God has not promised us an easy life. He has promised us that he'll be with us through those tough times. Jesus meets us in the middle of our storm to build our faith and to teach us to worship him with truth and spirit. And so as we, as we grow in our faith and in our relationship with Christ, he begins to show us his power and, and comforts us as we go through the rough parts of the trail. And so seek the comfort of Christ today. You will not only uh, be helping yourself, but you'll also be helping others come to see Christ as their guide as well. To wrap up, I just want to ask a question, Art. Are you involved in a circle of Christians who can lift you up? Uh, Jeremy already kind of encouraged you to do that, but in a small group, a Sunday school class, a men's Bible study, a women's Bible study, are you involved in a small group, a group of Christians that can help walk with you, to, to do life with you, to lift you up, to walk alongside of you? Do you have someone special, another believer in your life that you can walk this journey with? I've been blessed... Each town that I move into or a church I go to, I try to find someone that I can do life with, someone that I can be accountable with. And when I first came here, I quickly met Terry White. Now, most of you know Terry White, and, and we headed off, we formed a friendship, and we became accountability partners. We were open with each other. We took off the masks, and we were real with one another. And then the loser moved off to Oregon on me. <laughs> All right? 
but that's okay, that's okay. We still talk to each other on a weekly basis, you know, or at least try to. If not, it's every other week at, at the least. I mean, we try to get together that often on the phone and still talk about life and where we're at in our spiritual walk. But in the meantime, I found another man. His name's Pat. He's a minister here in town. And, and we get together on a weekly basis, and we just do life together. You know, we talk about the church. We talk about our spiritual walk. We talk about the struggles we have. And we hold each other accountable, and, and we need that. I need him to walk with me. He needs me to walk with him. And one of the greatest things about being a part of the church is that on a weekly basis, you come here, and we worship together in one. And we are walking, we're surrounded by people who are walking the same journey that we are walking on a daily basis. We are surrounded by people who have gone through what you are going through in life right now. I guarantee it. And I love when I stand out here in the foyer and I hear the different conversations taking place and I get to eavesdrop in on them and I hear these two talking over here and I hear them say, hey, would you pray for me about this? And I hear this conversation over here and they're saying, hey, we need to put attention on this. And I hear someone over here say, you know, we need to encourage this person. We need to, we need to help them out. And I see people coming alongside. They're coming alongside of you. They're coming alongside of me. And we're walking together. We're helping each other out on this journey. So understand, there will be times when it gets tough. It's a rocky road. It's a narrow path. It's a tough path to go on. And we are surrounded by people who are going to walk this journey with us. And like Craig said, trust your guide. One of the words, the Greek words for Jesus in the Bible that I love is the Greek word prodromos. Prodromos. And prodromos literally means the one who has gone before us. The one who has gone before us. And I would just encourage you to put your trust in prodromos, Jesus the one who has gone before us. I mean, if you were going out on a difficult climb, if you were going out on a difficult hike, would you not want a guide who's been there before? I mean, wouldn't you have a whole lot more confidence if you're heading out on this difficult hike, knowing that your guide knows where you're going, he's been there, he's done it? I'd have a lot more confidence in that, and it would be a whole lot more enjoyable. And the path is tough. The narrow path is hard. We're not going to sugarcoat it for you. It's hard, but when you have a padromus, one who has been there before you, it makes it a whole lot more enjoyable. So would you follow your padromus, Jesus Christ? Let's pray. God, we just thank you for uh, walking with us. Uh, God, I just want to thank you for this family that we have here, the church, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can walk this path together with. Father, I'm I'm just thankful to be here in Millersburg, with this family, with my brothers and sisters, walking this journey together with them. Sometimes we cry together, sometimes we laugh together. Sometimes we mourn together. But we're together. And we need to encourage one another, we need to pray for one another, and more importantly, we need to love one another. So God, I just pray as a family that we would come around each other and we would we would practice those one another's that we hear about in Scripture. That we would just love on each other, encourage each other, hold each other accountable. And when we see someone starting to stray and to walk into the darkness, that we would come alongside of them and we would shine the light and say, hey, let's get back on the path we need to be on. And so, Father, this morning, I just pray for this congregation. I pray for anyone who's maybe been walking in darkness, that they would come back into the light that they would find a fellow brother or sister in Christ to walk this path with, to get back in the light as you want us to walk in the light. Father, we thank you for leading the way, for being our Padromas, the one who has gone before. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.